So today I want to talk about information warfare. So um, I'm going to start with this. This is a quote by General James Mattis, a uh, four-star general. He became um, the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, in the previous administration. And he said, we must recognize that information warfare, the battle for hearts and minds of the global audience, is just as heavy a priority as the military operation itself and the tactical events on the battlefield must feed the narrative. Now, that's a great quote. I think it's right. And I also want you to do this. I want you to engage in this practice so that you're more comfortable as you're spreading information because you're engaged in informational warfare. I want you to lift the quote and then Google it whenever you're before you ever tweet or retweet something. And I did that and I found it here on the U.S. Naval Institute. James Mattis expressed a similar sentiment and he said it's the exact same quote. So with that, I'm then comfortable sharing this on Twitter because I don't want to be spreading disinformation and neither do you. Okay. With that in the background, now that's free. Let's, that's not related to what I'm about to talk about directly. What I'm about to talk about, I'm going to start with um, Ekaterina Shulman. She's a Russian political scientist. She's in the opposition and she's freaking brilliant. And I watched two of her lectures recently at the Freiburg Institute for Advanced Studies in, I think it's in Germany. Uh, and I, I just want to show this, this little less than one minute clip about polls and how you can trust what people say and the way that authoritarian governments think and that sort of thing. So here we go. How far can we trust the poll? Um, Authoritarian political regimes, especially modern autocracies, are sometimes called informational autocracies or competitive or electoral ones. Okay, so she called the regime an informational autocracy. Autocracy, we know what that is, authoritarian government. Uh, it's like Putin at the head, but it's informational as much as it is anything else. Listen to this. Uh, run on propaganda as much, even more than right. on violence. One they the run on propaganda even more than violence. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. Let's keep listening. The things they do is produce impression. They incessantly try to control the public sphere, including the theological theory. They try to subvert, in fact, any public or political or civil institution. But they are especially eager to control the polling data. Because okay, you now I talked about this to some degree yesterday where I was talking about what Russians really think. And by the way, I'm sorry, um, the sound was out on the first iteration of that uh, and it was not. And so <laughs> some of you were saying like, it's a metaphor. Dr. Curtis is just testing. No, it, it wasn't that. It was just technical details. But I appreciate that you were thinking that I was using it as a metaphor because I started talking at that it just went off like that. It just like in a mid sentence, it just, you couldn't hear it. So I reposted it. A number of you have watched it. If you have not watched this, I'm talking about like what the percentage of support is for the war and like, and, and what people who are willing to answer say. Now she was talking about, I'm not sure if it was in this lecture or another one. I think it was in this one that 95% of the population won't answer. Right. They just they're apolitical. They don't want to have anything to do with it. So when you do get an answer, you can't really necessarily be sure that this is what the population is. And that's what I was saying here with this, with my small sample. It's not a representative sample, but still you're getting some sense of what people are thinking about things. OK, so let's just a little bit more and then we'll move on to the next clip. The absence of free election, regular publications of various types of rating serve as a kind of substitute for election results. If you cannot afford being an autocrat, you cannot afford the risks of electoral transition, electoral rotation, you have still to show that you are not just a despot ruling by force, but that you rule by consent of the people, that what you do is in fact a reflection of what people want. How do you do 
So it's don't throw me out of power because, or don't rise up against me. You have it good. I'm taking care of you, that kind of thing. That's what an autocrat needs to show. As much as they don't need to worry about the polls because they can rig the polls, they still don't want the people turning against them and revolting. All right. So with that, how do they conduct this? Now, I just happened to watch uh, Starsky as well. And this is what Starsky was talking about. And he's kind of mocking how the Russians over-report things. <laughs> this is great. As usual, Russian fascists report five battle Battlestar Galacticas, two generals, illusion is eliminated, and several key cities wiped out. But you know, everything is possible when you lie. Also, and that, yeah, and that's right. And they do lie, and they unabashedly lie, and they lie, and they lie. And it's not just about military reports. I saw this fascinating piece yesterday as well. Now, this author that he's about to talk to spent five days watching Russian state TV, just of Russian doing nothing but watching Russian state TV, not just the news, all the TV shows. And this is what he found. TV. For an article in the Atlantic titled, I watched Russian television for five days straight, my full immersion in Putin's propaganda. Gary Steingart did not just watch news programs. He watched everything on Russian television, including what we would call reality shows. The reality of Russian life depicted on those shows is grim. The anti-impotence potion advertised on Russian TV is called The Emperor's Secret which the ads assure the drunken husbands from the reality shows, quote, can be mixed with alcohol. After watching... Now, I understand that that's not referring to Putin, although that would be an amazing um, tongue-in-cheek slap at the boss with plausible deniability, but it's actually referring to something Chinese. So um, that was my initial thought, like, wow, that whoever named that is just... <laughs> They, they're <laughs> they're going to fall out of a hotel window or something, but that's not in it. In five days of Russian television, Gary Steingart saw, saw Russia's war against Ukraine most accurately represented in Russian television by, actually, the typical drunken, abusive man in the reality shows. Russia is the spurned lover with the very aggressive nature taking out his inhumanity on the innocent neighbor next door, despite all the posturing and doublespeak Russian television announces as much to the world. Whether on the airwaves or perhaps someday at The Hague, the evidence has been clearly presented. Joining us now is New York Times bestselling author Gary Steingart. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, this this uh, reading about, as I did about Russian television, is much more than I've ever come to understand by our occasional coverage of what they show on so-called news programs and the, the talk shows there. Our audiences have some familiarity with that. It's the other programming where the propaganda is so fascinatingly in, embedded. Uh, was that a surprise to you? Yes, it was actually interesting to see that Russian propaganda exists in almost every single part of state television, not just the news. It's a full stop package. So, for example, you have a show where a doctor is talking about foods that help with your cardiovascular health. And he'll just happen to mention that the best onion to eat is red onion from Crimea, meaning Russian occupied Crimea. The, Part of Ukraine that they took over in 2000. Now, that's really interesting. Now, how can they do that? Because it's an informational autocracy where the government is controlling the media because this is they're, they're trying to use a softer power in order to influence so that they can have their way. It doesn't work so well in a free country like the West, like in America or in Western Europe. But it does work when you get to dictate what's on all the channels and you have your puppets in charge of that. So that's really interesting. 14. So everything has a double meaning and everything is there to remind the viewer, uh, whether it's reality TV or a health show or even a show where uh, young people are dancing. There's troops of young dancers. Those young dancers are also from a region that Russia has taken over. So you're constantly being reminded of sort of Russia's greatness and the importance of this war. 
Did you uh, did, did you have any understanding of what it means to be bombarded with this nonstop? And in terms of the credibility of the material, I mean, for for, for you, it was incredible. Uh, but you have other sources of information. Well, I think what's interesting is that a lot of Russians who watch state television day in, day out are older Russians. Uh, a lot of the very younger Russians get their news more from the Internet, which is one reason why Putin is now thinking of ways to, to cut off the Internet in Russia, or at least to censor it the way it's being censored in countries like China. Uh, but older people, and Russia is a very old country. It's demographically, it is not, uh, not a lot of Russians are having kids, you know. Uh, but demographically, a lot of older Russians or even middle-aged Russians uh, live and die by Russian state television. So after my article, now that's really interesting, and it's re interesting for this reason. She was talking. In, I'm not sure if it was in this lecture or the other one that I watched. That the demographic that most supports the war in Ukraine is the older population. If you're like 60 and up, you really, really, really support the war. And who's watching the most Russian state television? It's the older demographic came out, I would get all these emails from Russians in America. These are people who watch Russian state television in America and who have uh, mothers or mother-in-laws or father-in-laws. And they say, even here in America, they watch this nonstop and have a completely biased view of the world. So this isn't even just happening back in Russia. This is happening among the diaspora of Russia. So you're, you and your family left Russia when you were about eight years old. Did you find yourself, uh, when you were immersed in this television, wondering about what your life would be there today if you hadn't left? <laughs> well, I am very certain that uh, if I hadn't left Russia earlier, I would have left, as many young men especially did, and I'm not a young man, but right now they're getting people in their 60s to join the Russian army. They're really desperate for anybody to fight. So I think right now, and having a, a son, I would be probably fleeing to Turkey or Armenia or Georgia or many of the other places where uh, Russians of uh, Russian men especially find themselves, but also anyone who fight, who feels that Russia is not going to be successful in the next 10, 20, 30, infinity amount of years. What does it say about uh, the insecurity of the regime uh the, the, what does this propaganda ultimately communicate about the insecurity of the regime? There's, I think, a very kind of there's before he answers that. That's a really good question. If you feel like you have to control everything in the informational space, you're terribly insecure. If you feel like you can let people say what they want to say and get feedback and adjust and work through things, that's a very different place to be. Right. So but listen to his answer. Well, a feeling of superiority matched with a feeling of inferiority in a lot of Russian television. There's a superiority of saying, we are the strongest, we have the best culture, we're far better than Western culture, we're certainly far better than Ukrainian culture, which is why we can commit genocidal acts against them. But at the same time, a feeling of inferiority. There's constant, uh, you know, Anthony Blinken is on all the time, and, and it's, it's feeling of, why don't they like us? Gosh, all we're trying to do is, you know, invade another country. Why can't they love us the way they should, given how superior we are? So there's this endless cycle of superiority and inferiority that I think really extends to Russia's uh, way of dealing with the world for centuries, not just after Putin or during the Soviet Union. Uh, so, and I've talked about that before. There's this, there's a really real palpable when you get into Russian media, like this almost like Russian racism. We're the best. You're awful. Everybody else is that's not us is is not as good as us. And then, um, but it's also coupled with a schizophrenic kind of uh, inferiority complex. Like why are why does the West constantly want to persecute us? Is it because we're the best? I mean, is that what it is? Because, and it, those two things are, are coupled together in some way that I don't quite understand. But I've seen that too, and I've talked about it on numerous occasions. So uh, the feeling... Mm -hmm. you, uh, you report that the apparently the most popular Americans on Russian television are Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson. Well, the case of Donald Trump, Donald Trump, and you were talking about him in the previous segment, the many trials that the Donald is going to have to face in the next year or two or 
who knows how long. That is really one of the biggest things that Russian television, hence the Kremlin, is worried about. Because the feeling is that if Trump comes back, then we have a chance in winning against Ukraine. Because he may hold back on armaments, he may, I mean, there's, like, you know, as the leader of the free world, and certainly as, as one of the chiefs of NATO, uh, he is the person that can really help Ukraine win the war. And without him, we really have a chance. And Tucker, and I, I haven't seen Russian television since Tucker's demise from Fox, but I mean, you would see Tucker all the time. I was surprised they didn't just give him the whole hour, of, you know, trans <laughs> translated into Russian. At that well, moment. they did offer him, whether tongue in cheek or otherwise, a job on RT. So that tells you everything that you need to know about where Tucker stands. When you watch RT and then you watch Tucker, you can see where he's getting his ideas from. Would have been easier because you would just get snippets of him throughout the day on each of the three main Russian channels. He was their best friend. Gary Steingart, thank you very much for doing what uh, we couldn't do. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so that was a really insightful look into it. Now, there's another thing that I want to talk about, and that's the Russian media monitor. And I show this periodically. One of the things that um, uh, Ekaterina talked about was that they're talking to the general population, but they're really speaking to an audience of one because all their funding goes back to Putin. And if Putin's happy, everybody's happy. So with that, we're going to watch this and I'm going to read and I'm going to pause periodically. And as I do, I want you to understand and think through the really while they're speaking to the population, particularly the older population that watches this, they're also speaking to Putin. Here's Sergei, the chief propagandist. I think everyone is used to this. They'll strike some power grid, some sort of distribution stations, some sad grain terminals. But imagine this. A sea of fire crashing upon the residence of the Ukrainian president on Ukraine's Supreme Council on the buildings of Ukraine's security service. The kind Russian people can't even imagine this. It's strange, right? I think it's strange. I'm also surprised. Missiles are flying. Where to? Well, let's read about it. Let me remind you that 12 missile carriers TU-95 have taken off from our airfields. That's approximately 150 cruise missiles. At least potentially, this is their maximum potential. Up to 150 cruise missiles have possibly launched toward Ukraine. Now, it wasn't that many, it turns out. That wasn't what it was. But this is how he's describing this. The, the mighty Russian you know, military going to attack Ukraine. Okay. It says, on my Telegram channel, Mardan, I offer for people to place this. Let's this bet. Let's try this. Not for money, just for fun. Will there be a cruise missile strike on Bankova Street? Yes or no? Now, that's Bankova Street. That's like um, saying Pennsylvania Avenue in the United States. Okay, that's where the government resides. President, since the moment Russia ceased its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, global wheat prices have already gone up by 17%. Now, he's, he's proud of that. He thinks that's a good thing. And he, he wants to see it grow even more because he's not worried about the tens of millions plunged into food security. He's looking at this as a positive thing. For people unfamiliar with all of this, here's how I would put it. This is incredibly high. For some, this means gigantic immeasurable profits, especially for those people using leverage on the stock exchange. For others, especially those countries who are forced to import wheat, there are many of them. For them, this means enormous costs. Okay, and he's and he's fine with the enormous costs. If a country has to buy 30 million tons of wheat on a yearly basis to feed itself, like Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Turkey, or China, you can easily calculate how much money this means for them. And yet, he's okay with this. How nervous they are, he says. Yeah, and he's fine with that. Like, he's, he's okay that they're going to be put in this position because the Russians are doing this to the Ukrainians and indirectly causing huge inflationary spikes for food for these countries. And, and yet he can't see that they might not be happy about that. 12 Russian missile uh, carriers take off and someone in Beijing or Algiers breaks out in sweat. 
They understand that an increase in 17% is just a start. It will later become 27 or 37 or maybe more. Russia is not backing down. Okay, now they break into a weather report, and it's the weirdest thing. On Wednesday, a synoptic situation in the lower reaches of the Dnipro and the lowland of the Black Sea will be preconditioned by a warm and dry sector of a cyclone with characteristic simple military operation. In the zone of the special military operation, cloudiness will reach 4.7, the upper mean with cumulus clouds with a lower edge of whatever that was, the top of 2.3, the visibility is more than 10 meters, the wind in the southern quarter 3.8 meters, the air temperature will rise to 30 35 during the day and 18 to 23 at night that is the weirdest weather report i've ever seen but again it goes back to the point from the previous video that russia is contro controlling all tv including the regular tv shows the reality tv shows the news even the weather report okay that's just absolutely amazing. I'm going to close with this. This is from Anna from Ukraine, who's giving us her word for the day. Today, we will learn one universal truth in our Ukrainian word of the day, and that will be a phrase, Russia always lies. Russia always lies sounds in Ukrainian as Russia zavzdei Russia. Russia zavzdei Russia. Of course, you can substitute Russia with Orkland, as many of you write in comments. If you want to learn more about Ukrainian and our country, please subscribe. Now, there's a reason that she's making that case, because they do tend to lie again and again and again. And as Ekaterina pointed out, there's a reason for the lying, and information warfare is important. You're engaged in information warfare right now by informing yourself and spreading this message. I thank you for sharing this, and I thank you for the likes and the subscribes and the coffees. Most of all, thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.